Welcome to Kicking Up With Sensei and another day of our Female Warrior Week. And today we're joined by five five times world champion kickboxer and commentator of the first ever unit Ultimate Fighting Championship, um, Kathy Long. You're very welcome, Kathy. Thank you very much. Thank very you. happy to be here. Very honored. Thank you very much. Now. And uh, if you could just give the audience a little bit of background and to your martial arts. Uh, gosh, I started with Aikido when I was 14 years old and oh. I've studied, um, I, I got my shodan in Aikido and then um, went on to do Kung Fu Sansu and JKD and a uh, little bit of Wing Chun and um, now I'm studying Tai Chi and, and uh, a few other things. So, Excellent. And I've, you were yeah. one of the first women to get involved in full contact karate or kickboxing way back and how did you get involved in full contact fighting? Uh, well, there was, um, I was living in, in central California, a, an area called Bakersfield. And that's where I was running my school, my Kung Fu Sansu school. Um, and there was a girl who challenged me to do point fighting in a tournament. And I just said, look, I don't do that type of fighting um, because in Kung Fu Sansu, we stick the fingers in the eyes and we hit them in the windpipe and crush their testicles and stomp on their knees. And we don't, um, we don't do that. We don't do point fighting. Yeah. So it was, you know, I said, look, I really don't understand it. And I don't know the rules and I don't, um, I, I really don't want to compete in something like that where I have to pull my shots. Yeah. Long story short, her karate instructor uh, called my instructor and asked if I'd be willing to do just an exhibition kickboxing bout with the girl who had challenged me to do point fighting. So as it turns out, she also did kickboxing and had done it for a couple of years. And, and uh, she weighed 190 pounds. Uh, I don't know what that is in stones, but um, you know, I weighed about 120 pounds, which was quite a bit lighter. And um, I only had 10 days to learn how. So I went to a boxing gym and <laughs> trained in boxing for 10 days. And then we had our fight. Um, and because it was an exhibition, there was no winner announced. And the weight class was, you know, very different, yeah. right? So, but I really discovered a lot about myself in, in that I love, I'm, a, I'm hooked on adrenaline. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and um, I perform well when I'm under pressure. So I, I just kept with it. And and continued on and eventually got to where I am. It was uh, quite a journey. Excellent. And how do you go from an exhibition fight to five world titles? It's it's a big step. <laughs> it's a huge step. Um, yeah. And you know, I did it uh, fairly quickly. You know, I don't recommend that people learn how to fight and have a fight after ten days of learning how. <laughs> but it's just I, I'm I'm. For some reason, I, I seem to thrive under pressure. So I had a few amateur fights in boxing as well as in kickboxing and then immediately turned pro. And when I turned pro, I, was, I, had, I had no experience as a professional fighter. And the first girl that I fought, her record was 18 and two. And I lied, I lied to the commission. And, and at that time they weren't, really, they weren't really good at being able to check someone's record so I just said I'm, I'm six and oh as a professional fighter <laughs> and got licensed and they said okay so they let me fight this girl and we fought to a draw and um, from there you know I, I had a few more professional fights and then fought for my first world title and um, it was just it seemed like everything happened very quickly you know as, yeah. as time went on um, and I, I, it's not something I planned to do. It was just something that fell in my lap and I discovered a love for it and, and um, trained as hard as I possibly could. All my sparring partners were men and they were already well experienced, uh, US champions, world champions, national champions. And these are guys that, um, you know, took it very seriously. So when I sparred with them, they did not take it easy on me. Yeah. And I learned, I learned how to hit hard. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's the most important thing now. But, uh, and did you find there was a lot of women in martial arts back then? Or is it a lot more popular now to females than it was? 
Well, um, just that the women are now competing in the UFC where, you know, it started off with just men and that they're allowed now to be in the UFC and their, their skill level is, has grown exponentially. I mean, it's incredible to see that women are well-rounded as, especially if you're fighting in the UFC, you have to be, because if you have a weakness in a certain area, um, competing as an MMA fighter, then you will get exposed and that weakness will show and, and they will capitalize on it. So nowadays, um, you know, the, the skill level with women is really good with stand up, really good with wrestling, really good with jujitsu and uh, the takedowns and locks. It's, it's, uh, it's something I'm really proud to see yeah. and very grateful. Excellent. And it's not too long ago since you've actually give MMA a go yourself, was it? And had, I think, a two or three fights, didn't you, in MMA? Yeah, I, I had fun with it, but, you know, it was later in my career, and, you know, my last fight was something that I promoted myself. <laughs> so, you know, I went to Mexico, and I had some friends there, and we promoted this event and, and had fun, yeah. you know, and that was really just what I wanted to do. Is I was 52 at the time, and, uh, you know, I, I, I thought, what the heck, you know, I, I just want to give it a few more tries and, and have fun with it. You know, and by win or lose, it doesn't matter. What matters is I got to experience it. And that was what I wanted. And do you think it's important to keep that fun aspect to martial arts throughout your journey from when you, you know, first start it, right it up? The truth is, because if you're not having fun, um, I mean, there's a difference between uh, training hard and being pushed hard, being pushed outside of your comfort zone to being abused. And, you know, I spent many, many years being severely abused during my kickboxing career. And I, I realized then, you know, after I was, after I left that, that, that person and was no longer training under them, I decided at that point, if I'm going to stick with it, then I need to have fun, you know, and I need to be able to still be pushed beyond my comfort zone and challenge myself often, but have fun while I'm doing it. You know, and know that, uh, you know, I'm not being put down and I'm not being beaten up on purpose. And, you know, it, it was just one of those things where if somebody's having fun in what they're doing, even though they're being challenged, they will, they will progress and they will get better. And, and, yeah. and when it becomes an enjoyable thing to do, then, of course, you're going to want to keep doing it. Excellent. And you were actually the commentator along with Bill Superfoot Wallace in the first UFC event. How did that come about? You know, they just called me out of the blue and asked if I'd be willing to do it. And I said, of course, I'd be happy to. <laughs> I mean, I honestly didn't know what what was in what was involved and what it entailed. Um, I just knew that there was going to be a quote unquote no rules. Of course, there were a few rules, but for the most part, um, it was a, a what we call a free for all. <laughs> you know, just go in there and and do what you know how to do. And you know, these these competitors that were invited to, to compete were, you know, it was a chance of winning fifty thousand dollars. I mean, yeah. Come on, who who's not going to want to do that? But you know, the, the people when we were when I was sitting in the rules meeting which is something I really wanted to be a part of. I wanted to know what the actual rules were. <laughs> yeah. There was a lot of questions, um, especially the boxer, um, who, who said, well, what do I do? Do I wear gloves, both gloves? Or do I wear just hand wraps? Or do I wear hand wraps in one glove or no, and, the, and free hand in the other hand? And, the, and they said, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah. Now, interesting. <laughs> that's that's not a good sign. <laughs> no, it's not a good sign. I mean, they would say things like, "Well, can I take him down and keep hitting him?" Yes, you can. Well, can I take him down and and what happens then? Well, you know, either get up. Do I get up? I mean, they just didn't know. Yeah. They didn't have answers because it was the first one that they'd ever done, and they just thought, you know, we're we're setting it up so that you can do pretty much anything you want. Yeah. And whatever goes. <laughs> Excellent. And did you think back then that it would end up being as big as it is now? I did not think back then it would end up being as good as, <laughs> as popular as it is now. Yeah. And, you know, I, I have to say that for 
when when I saw it at first, I thought to myself, well, okay, so it's it's the Gracie show. And, you know, the Gracies are going to win and that's what they set it up for. And that's what's going to make them popular so that they can, you know, open schools all over the United States and make a lot of money. And, you know, and I was a little turned off by it uh, at first. But as it progressed, even though there were several states, you know, in America that were banning the UFC, um, the ones that were still showing the events, I, I did notice that the skill level of all of the competitors did rise. Like, it's, sim it's something, uh, this interesting phenomena where you're in a room with people who are far more experienced than you, you either rise to the occasion or you fall down below and, and you fail miserably. So in that respect, I noticed that the competition um, rose and there was a while there where kickboxers came in and they were competing with it and they learned a little bit of groundwork, a little bit of wrestling and they would dominate the, the, the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu folks who were, you know, good at taking people down and keeping them down and, and, um, and getting a submission fairly quickly because, yeah. you know, the stand up fighter, quote unquote, doesn't really know how to do ground. So, but when there was this wave of kickboxers coming in and dominating, well, that upped the game. That meant all the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu fighters really had to get good at stand up and yeah. welcome to the Thai, and they brought that in. And then there was wrestling that came in, and that was, you know, uh, taking precedence for a good while until everybody said, okay, now I need to know Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, I need to know Muay Thai, I need to know wrestling. And then judo came in. And then, you know, it just it kept evolving and growing. and you know, the more well-rounded you were as a competitor, the better. I mean, at first it was people who were good at their field. Like I'm good at Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. So, you know, uh, chances are good I'm going to win this fight because my competitor doesn't know it. But it has changed and evolved and grown since then. So after a while, I thought, all right, so it's not just the Gracie show. <laughs> and it's, it's something that um, really does highlight the skill level of each competitor as they come in. Excellent. And you mentioned there at the start too that uh, you've taken up Tai Chi now. It's a kind of a retrospect to what you've done in the past kind of thing. How did you end up moving on to Tai Chi and from combat sports? Did well, I still I still train in kickboxing, oh, okay. and you know, I, I since I've moved to Washington State, I haven't yet uh, gotten back into Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, but um, I train little bits here and there when I can, and I, I still train in martial arts in that respect. Yeah. Um, but I've just added Tai Chi because it's something that I did a long time ago when I was um, first starting in kickboxing, and I used Tai Chi as a warm up. And it was one of the most brilliant ways of, of getting your body, all the fluids rushing through your body and getting it, getting it warmed up and moving, um, and then start your kickboxing training. And it was something that I found warmed me up better than anything else I've ever done. And I, 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 I let it go for a long, long time, and now I'm getting back into it. Yeah. It's, it's actually a brilliant practice. I actually took it up myself about three years ago just because I heard so much bad stuff about it i thought i'll <laughs> rather than just listen to hearsay i thought i'll go and give it a go good and for you i went and i think within about three weeks i actually noticed my sparring was lasting longer because i was getting more control of my breath yes. so my breathing got a lot a lot more functional and i, I haven't given up since <laughs> it's that's wonderful it's, it's just like the backbone but yeah, I'm so glad to hear that because a lot of people think Tai Chi is just for the older folks who aren't competing anymore and yeah. can't move anymore. And it's like, you know, there is a huge benefit for health in Tai Chi, yeah. um, but it's also, it helps with balance. It helps with um, building muscle, believe it or not. It helps with building flexibility. It helps with, you know, anytime you can bring up your internal energy and project it in a way that that is going to help you then of course you know it's something that all i think in my humble opinion all martial artists should be doing tai chi yeah no matter what age definitely as and well as meditation yeah meditation is very important now but as you've had a very successful career from 
kickboxing to UFC to moving on to Tai Chi and a variety of other martial arts throughout your career. But what advice would you give a young guard starting out in martial arts? I would highly recommend that if a girl gets involved in martial arts, if she, um, there's so much available. And, you know, maybe it's one of those situations where the child can only study one or two arts because that's all that's available in her area. But um, she has to, as long as the instructor is encouraging that girl and, and has a positive influence on, on the young girl's life, then it doesn't truly matter what martial arts you start in. Um, and for me, it's a lifelong journey. You know, I'll, I'll never stop doing martial arts in that respect. Uh, it's, you know, I may have, I have taken years off from time to time just to let my body recover and heal and, and take a break and then come back to it. Um, and that, to me, that's something that, um, you know, I, I try over the years, you know, when I'm not doing martial arts, I'm doing some other type of art. Um, you know, I love sketching and watercoloring, although I haven't done it lately. I, I, I love it very much. I play the guitar. Um, I also play the harp and the violin and the cello. So um, it's something that I personally enjoy as, as well as martial arts, as well as kickboxing. Um, I'm looking to get back into teaching Kung Fu San Su again, which I'm a master in. And I haven't done that art in a, in a good while, though I, I'm, I'm, I really am feeling I need to get back into it, you know, just for my own sake. Yeah, definitely. And I think that answered your question. I went off on a <laughs> tangent. <laughs> yeah, but um, I've noticed during the pandemic now, we've been kind of a lot of dojos and that have been closed and uh, technology has played a big part of the last year. But do you think it's important to keep that going in the future? And you know what? Um, as much as I hate teaching on Zoom, <laughs> uh, it, it is incredibly valuable to still have that communication and that contact with people. Yeah. Um, I, I, I teach kickboxing and, you know, if the student has their own bag, then, you know, I'll, I'll make sure that I, I direct it toward bag work as well as working punching and kicking in the air right. as well as um if they have a partner together with them then they can hold mitts with each other so in that respect um one of the really great benefits of teaching on zoom is that i can teach people from other states you know who want to join in on class or a student who's moved away to texas for example and i'm in washington where they can tune in and they can take the class and that's a huge benefit to teaching on Zoom. And it's something that we will continue even after the pandemic's over um, because we, we want to keep in contact with the students that we've gained. Um, yes, we've lost students, especially with the little ones. The, it's difficult for them to really relate. It's hard to, you know, when they're at home and they have the comforts of their home, yeah. you know, they're not as strict as, as being in the school and they're not allowed to walk over and grab some cookies and start eating them while class is going, <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, they wouldn't be able to do that in the school, so they can't do it at home either. And it's, yeah. sometimes it's hard for them to, you know, to make that connection. Okay, I'm really, I'm training now and not, not at home, you know, and just watching a screen. Yeah. But with adults, you know, it, it, some of them, uh, you know, they just have a hard time doing things by themselves solo, you know? Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's a give and take. We've gained students, we've lost some students, but in, in retrospect, I think we've maintained um, a good amount. And that's because thankfully, um, Restita was, you know, just on top of everything and immediately uh, signed on with Zoom and got, and got things going. And that was really a huge benefit. Excellent. One of the things I've noticed over the past year now with technology is how creative instructors have been getting. <laughs> you have to. The, the longer it goes on, the more creative. I'd love to see that continue because I've, I have see instructors a lot of the time just going through the same, they're kind of in a rut of teaching the same things the same way. And it's great to see them actually being creative and thinking, how can I teach this as a solo drill? Right. And actually moving away from their comfort zone so to speak, and actually thinking outside the box. It's it's great to see that. Well, you know, preservation kicks in and, and when you're stuck in 
let's say with this, this particular problem that we have, where we have to teach on Zoom, we have to teach on Zoom. You know, if you want to maintain your clientele, you, know, you really do have to become creative. And that's where you either get on YouTube or Google or you talk to friends and you, you ask them, what are you doing? How are you handling this? And, and you know, having a nice network of other martial arts instructors who you know, will happy to share their ideas and things that they've done makes a big difference, it really does. Definitely. And finally, Kathy, what does the future hold for Kathy Long? Have you any plans in the future to compete again or? I don't think I'm going to compete in, uh, in the contact sports, although I do want to compete in, I don't know, things like um, uh, the mud run or, or events like that. Um, I'm forgetting at the moment the bigger one that uh, I had started training for and then um, hurt my foot. And it's escaping me right now, but it's a huge, like a three mile long obstacle course. Yeah. Of, uh, and I'm, I, I can't remember the name of it but anyway it's very similar to the mud run or events like that so you know that's something I'd like to continue I just like to continue competing in something yeah. you know um, I, I don't want to I don't want to just become idle even though um, it's been at least four years since I've actually done any serious training and you know I injured my foot and then I pulled my calf muscle and it's just one of those things that keeps compounding and something I would say to younger athletes, especially younger martial artists, um, what you do in your 20s and 30s will affect you in your 50s. It will. So if you're constantly injuring yourself or not taking care of yourself, if you're not getting, you know, if you're not taking hot Epsom salt baths or um, getting massages or making sure you're eating right and getting the plenty of the sleep that you need, it will wreak havoc on you when you turn 50 and you're going into your 50s and 60s. And let's say you want to continue on as a martial artist, but you know, you've broken too many bones and you've pulled too many muscles and you've torn too many ligaments. And guess what? It will affect you. So oh. take care of you. For every, I, I stress on my fighters over and over and over. I stress on my fighters. If you train for two hours, you have to have at least one hour of maintenance at least, yeah. and that means you roll on the foam roller, get massages, take hot baths, you know, make sure that you stretch, maintain your flexibility, you know, it's something that's incredibly vital and you don't stop doing that when you stop competing. Yeah. You don't stop doing that because you have to continue taking care of you. Yeah, I couldn't and agree more. Now I've had a few injuries myself since I start, stopped competing and some of them I've just ignored and kind of thought, just keep going. And yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm sort of <laughs> a few years on now, I'm thinking like, I'm it's starting to play up a little bit. And it's <laughs> so. The, but, the uh, ouches and ouches show up <laughs> when you don't train. <laughs> yeah. I've noticed recently now, you get a lot of cold weather here in Ireland, but when it, when it is cold, my two knees get very sore and hard to walk. And I'm only in my mid thirties. But uh, uh -oh. I know it's it's very much down to training with injuries. It's just when I've, I've had a fight coming up and had a minor injury, I just kept going. Didn't want to lose time. You're preaching to the choir, my friend. I mean, I fought my first world title fight with broken ribs. Yeah. And I went into the fight with broken ribs and there was no way I was going to tell anybody anything. I just, I just faked it. <laughs> I'm one of those fighters and I'm so grateful that... When I'm in the middle of the fight, I have so much adrenaline pumping through me that I don't feel any pain at all. I don't feel anything. I broke my hand when I was fighting. I, uh, my ribs were already broken. I broke my shin when I was fighting in France for the WKA world title. And you know what? I didn't even know it was broken until a week later when I went to kick the bag. <laughs> so thank God for adrenaline. But <laughs> the, the adrenaline wears off and the pain starts. <laughs> Oh, it, it, it does. <laughs> That's it now. It was a pleasure speaking with you today, Kathy, and thank you very much for your time and hearing your story, your journey, and it was thank fantastic. You. Thank you very much, Nick. You're very welcome. It's my pleasure to talk, to talk with you. Yeah. Thank you, Nick.